Hi, Wayne Dorban here for the bi-weekly NTP Seed webinar huddle that we hold here at our Northern Colorado headquarters in Loveland, Colorado, both live here at our site and also going out over the web to those of you that are watching. Enjoy what we have for you today. Hi, everybody. It's Wayne Dorban from Northern Colorado with our bi-weekly Economics in Actions webinar. And Boy, we have just had everything work great here today. Um, I think if you remember from our last two or three times, we've had technical difficulties of one kind or another. And we've got Nancy, who's our guest. She's been on the line with me for the last 10 minutes, and we've been visiting. Her connection's awesome. Um, the only thing I complained about to tell Nancy is I wore the wrong color of a shirt. I might just blend into the wall here in the background because it should have been something a little darker. But anyway, that uh, we learned from that. And Nancy's actually got a wall behind her that's a lot more attractive than mine. She's actually looks like she's in the ocean, sort of. She's got fish behind her there and everything. Um, but before we get to our talk today, which is going to be with Nancy Zygmanis, who um, I, I'm going to ask her because I think I'm remembering how long we've known each other, but it's been a little bit, little while. She'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and she's coming to us from Florida where we've been talking about the weather today, where it's she's in summer there, and it's still where it's getting pretty warm every day. And she actually likes the heat. She's going to talk about that a little bit. Um, and all I'd like to do to get this started before we go to Nancy is um, I literally just booked today because we were, we, were, we were having a little challenge with our next webinar. By the way, there's a, a motorcycle outside the building right now, if you're hearing that. Um, and we're going to be really excited to have Evan Folds with us on the 5th of August. And I'm going to talk about that in a second. Um, the 5th is a Wednesday, the first Wednesday of the month. And Evan is an agriculture icon, really, in North Carolina, Wilmington, North Carolina area. Um, he has a whole bunch of different initiatives that involve farming in a way that you probably haven't thought about it. So, for example, he has a um, an initiative where he is converting people's lawns into into farming locations, not gardens even, just literally parts of a farm. And he's got about 50 of those in the regional area that he's in. Any a lot of really cool things of that nature. I was talking with him just a little earlier today. So now let me just give you the warning. That is not two weeks from now like it would normally be. We have one of those weird months where the fifth, the first Wednesday of August actually comes three weeks from today. So don't try to tune in in two weeks because um, we won't be, uh, won't be doing anything then. So anyway, without further ado, um, I am so excited to have a, a longtime friend. I'm going to let her say how long she thinks it's been um, on with me today. She's made a move. We've actually, through most of the time that we've known each other, have known each other through her living in Ohio. And she's now down in Florida, as I said. It's Nancy Zygmanis. And she's coming to us live from her, I don't even know, what uh, I'm assuming in your house, Nancy? Yeah, I'm here in my townhouse, actually. Awesome. Um, just got out of work, so <laughs> uh, I moved down here, and I now work at a wastewater treatment plant, which is kind of fun. Um, and as far as, as long as I've known you, it has to be probably at least seven years. Yeah, I... Did you get started on the Goodyear project when we first started having conference calls? If you did, then I know it's I know almost exactly how long it is. Uh, just a little bit after you started having conference calls. So we're gonna have our nine year anniversary the next call. So wow. It'll be probably eight years maybe then or so that, that we've known each other. Um, and we've gotten to be such a family in this call, and this is a conference call that we have about a project that Nancy's going to talk a little bit about here. And, you know, the call will have anywhere from maybe 10 people on it. Maybe the most we've ever had is 25 or 30. And it's a truly inter-agency, inter-entity call. So it will be people from the private sector that are developers and consultants and advisors and lawyers and so on. It'll be people from the governmental sector who are regulators, like Nancy was working for the state of Ohio at that time, and it'll be um, it'll be um, people from the cities, uh, the city of Akron, from other governmental governing entities. A really cool call. Well, anyway, we've become such family that when somebody like Nancy and when Nancy left, I don't remember exactly what we did, but we would have 
talked about it maybe several times before she was going to be gone and even after she's been gone we would say oh we're, we're missing Nancy right now and such so it, it's it's not just your typical business conference call it's really a, um, a, a you know it's, it's all business after we get past a little bit of the niceties at the front end but it's a it's an interesting vehicle we've been using anyway I'm gonna stop there and Nancy why don't you tell us you started a little bit but tell us where you're at now even more specifically where in Florida and what got you there and I think we've got some slides that we can show so what you do for a living now what motivated you to move from Ohio to Florida um, I think those are things our audience will really love to hear well um, in working with you I actually spent uh, 24 years um, eight lovely years working with you uh, 24 total in Ohio uh, as a regulator for Ohio EPA and um, anybody that's been to Ohio realizes that the weather has not been getting better down there up there it's been actually getting worse uh, it's been getting colder and rainier and things like that and um, I'm a type of person that always likes change um, I know a lot of people don't but that is one thing I do I do like uh, so I always get involved in a lot of different things so I I basically um, started to look around. I have two daughters who were looking to go south for college, uh, my oldest for grad school and my youngest for undergraduate. And uh, my youngest ended up ending up here in Florida. And as we were looking for uh, different colleges down here, I really fell in love with the weather down in Florida and just the people in the area. So I started looking for government jobs, being the government servant that I have been for 24 years up in Ohio, and was lucky enough to get an interview with Collier County, which is the Naples-Fort Myers area. Um, actually, Fort Myers is one county north. It's mostly Naples down here. Uh, and I now live in Naples and uh, became the environmental compliance manager for the wastewater division of Collier County. So we have two wastewater plants that we have permitted. We have underground injection wells as part of those permits. We have a wetland that is incorporated into our system. We have uh, what they call irrigation water. So the wastewater plants actually treat the water and recycle it back to different areas and users such as golf horses and landscaping for reuse instead of putting it back into the ground or putting it back into the lake like we've been in Ohio so that's all been it's been very interesting and new um, as my career in Ohio has been mostly hazardous waste and super fun brownfield work which um, has been very exciting working with Wayne on uh, some of those projects as well so that was kind of where I was uh, that was my transition um, loving the heat down here I know probably most of the people in Ohio would shudder and then anywhere up in the Northeast um, but I like the 90 degrees and the 80 percent to 90 percent humidity uh, got a little had to get a little used to the rainy season um, kind of think of the rainy season as spring up north and down here it's all summer long <laughs> along with the hurricane season so that's been really interesting let's go back a little further Nancy I think we might have a slide up now that talks about your BS in biology and MBA in sustainability. Mm -hmm. Take us back a little and tell us where your education, where that education was back. Even go further, where'd you grow up? Where was home as a child? Um, I grew up in Valley View, Ohio, uh, the floodplain, uh, back in Ohio near Cleveland, Ohio. Um, I went to Cleveland State University and got my Bachelor of Science in Biology with a minor in Chemistry there. Um, and then basically I started in the biomedical field um, but found environmental a lot more interesting and a lot more fulfilling and I moved from there to an environmental laboratory and started in basically my minor which was chemistry doing uh, environmental analysis and sampling for a lab 
and uh, about two and a half years after that I had applied to the state of Ohio that was looking to build a hazardous waste division, the RECRA uh, piece of the environmental regulations and I got hired there and the rest is kind of history after 24 years so um, but did a did a lot in um, in the agency one of the things I, I won a award with uh, NASA Glenn Research Center for uh, the coordination between NASA and the airport <sighs> Uh, the airport was um, expanding. Cleveland Hopkins added some longer runways and an additional runway, and they actually went over part of NASA Glenn's facility uh, and over three landfills. So we were they were working with both entities who um, had a Space Act agreement, and we're trying to work all through those legal, which. Um, I'm sure you've you've had those issues, Wayne, where sometimes the lawyers are really great and sometimes the lawyers kind of get into the way. Right. So <laughs> uh, we were working through some of those issues and ended up with um, uh, kind of the agency playing the facilitation role and, and me in particular. So it garnished a, uh, a Quasar Award from NASA for that interaction. What's your, most, what's your most vivid memory of those two years? You said maybe as much as two and a half in the laboratory way back early in your career. Um, there was a reason to go to the regulatory side. Uh, 15 hours, 16, 18 hours uh, on and uh, rushing to get things done and it, it was you were in the trenches a lot. It was a lot of work, but it was also a lot of fun. Was um, it a private lab or was that a governmental lab? No, that was a private lab. We we did sampling for Alcoa and GM and we did a lot of their regulatory sampling. So we would get just cooler after cooler in every day and had to get those results out within, you know, some in some cases twenty four hours and Sometimes we'd get a little bit longer doing the old uh, TCLP analysis and EP tox analysis for hazardous waste, and it was a challenge um, and a lot of work, but a lot of fun. It was I thought it was a great way to start. It, just just because I maybe was even in that industry at that time, um, who was if you don't mind, who was that, and are they still around? They are. They're not. They're not in Cleveland anymore. But it was uh, thermoanalytical, mm. and they were out of Ann Arbor, Michigan. Okay. And was Hull around? Wait, had John Hull started Hull by then? He just started, um, and he really. Um, I really got to know Hull and Associates once I moved to the agency. But he had started in in Cleveland by that time when I, I was doing wondered, analysis. I just wondered if you'd done any for them. So one last question back from back then. Um, did, um, were you, were you doing, you were probably a jack, it sounds like you might have been, everybody might have been jacks of all trades. In other words, you didn't just sit all day on a, on a specific instrument. You didn't do a, you know, you didn't, you weren't on an AA all day. You were already talking about organic stuff you were doing earlier or on a, TCLP, you know, different kinds of, it's, it was it a typical sort of you needed to do everything. You had to at least learn how to do everything. Yeah, we were, we were actually a small lab, so there wasn't a lot of us. Um, and we basically learned pretty much every analysis that we did, as well as we conducted a lot of the sampling, and we did asbestos, we did um, some biologicals and things like that. So we we had a lot of good experience in in working there. How did that? How has that helped you through the rest of your career? I, I would think it would have. I would. Hope it had actually. Yeah, it, it did. It it showed me a lot of, um, you know, how the other side. So you you can't you know just look from your golden palace and you should have done this because field conditions are definitely a lot different out there. And 
um, the pressures of the people that you're dealing with as far as your um, clients, that relationship is a lot different than the regulator has with that. So it gives you a, a better perspective, a more rounded perspective, I think. Um, as well as I think you you learn a lot more in those situations. As a regulator, um, you can pigeonhole yourself pretty easily. If all I wanted to do was review um, permits, that would be an easy thing to focus only on. Um, the nice thing also about my regulatory experience is I had a lot of great supervisors and managers that let me branch out and do some really different things as I went through my career. Um, but in, in a lot of small companies and a lot of consulting companies, you don't get that. You're, you're kind of thrown into whatever situation they need you. So I think it gives you a good perspective. Good. So let's go back even further now because this is a question that we our, our audience always loves. Um, Let's take it back and let's say you were, you remember back when you were a 15 year old girl, it was a Saturday, let's say, and it was a beautiful Saturday. You didn't have any other requirements in your life. You could kind of spend whatever you'd want to be doing on that afternoon. What would Nancy have been doing? Uh, well, I, I'm a scientist at heart, so I was always um, looking for something different to do. Uh, my mom would yell at me. I would prick the cat and look at blood under a microscope and <laughs> tear her roses apart to look under the microscope and catch bugs and different things like that. So I, I was the true biologist. Um, and unfortunately, I raised one of the same as I was. My youngest is exactly the same way. So oh, wow. <laughs> cool. And I'm going to ask about her in just a minute, but let's stay with you on that time because you said something that I don't think would be completely common. So um, did how did you get that microscope? Did your parents, I mean, did your parents note what your interests were? Or did you beg for it? Because I don't think a microscope in a home, um, you know, even today would be very common, but certainly when you were 15. <laughs> yeah, no, I um, actually, uh, for Christmas, I asked for a microscope set and, uh, as well as a chemistry set. So I had both in my house. And then, of course, I always had the, the big boxes that people could play with and um, always got into a lot of the science things and, and just uh, also exploring. Uh, we were, uh, our area became the Cuyahoga Valley National Recreation Center and the Canal Visitor Center. So I spent a lot of time uh, wandering the woods down in Valley View as well, which was a lot of fun from a biology standpoint. Very cool. Um, so now I'm going to tell a little bit on myself and, and maybe on my wife, Deb, who, again, you guys all know because she's been our producer here. And by the way, this is really Brian's taken over. This is the first time, I think, maybe the last time in this one that Deb's not been doing hardly any of the production. So I thank him for that. And Emily's there helping him. Thank both of them. But now a little story on me and Deb. But um, it's going to start with a question. Do you remember the brand of that microscope? No, I don't. But in honesty, my daughter has it back in Ohio somewhere. <laughs> wow. Okay. So it's still in the family. Well, here's the story on me. Unless she's thrown it away in the last couple of weeks, I still have mine. And it's a Tyco. Um, and it's in a yellow box. Still have the original box. So is that it all? I'm trying. Wouldn't it be small worldish if you had the same microscope sort of um, so <laughs> Tyco was, you know, like Mattel, they were, I think, one of the really major toy manufacturers and sort of more sophisticated toys, but I still have mine, and unless it's gotten um, thrown away over the last several weeks, because I tend to hoard a little bit, so uh, I have some things from my youth that maybe my family wished I didn't still have. <laughs> but you said something about your daughter, though, a couple things. One is how she... She, your youngest loves science, so and then you said she was in Florida. So how far away from where you're at is she going to college, and and or is that happening in the fall, or or what's that status? No, actually, she came down before me, and she okay. doesn't let me forget that. Um, she is at the University of South Florida, St. Petersburg, right okay. there on Ta uh, Tampa Bay, okay. and the Gulf Coast, and she is studying marine biology. 
So right. she came down. Uh, we dropped her off and moved her into her dorm last August. And uh, then my husband, unfortunately, had to make two trips down to Florida in January. One to drop her back at school and then the next to bring me down <laughs> to, to uh, move into a townhouse down here. So he's, he's been quite the traveler between Florida and Cleveland. Oh, wow. um, and then my oldest is, uh, will be starting grad school this fall. And the two of them got an apartment together, and uh, they'll be halfway between St. Petersburg and Tampa. So is she is your oldest now at USF also, or is she somewhere else? She will be well. She will be at USF. She graduated Cleveland State okay. in December. Took some time off, and she starts her grad program in statistics in the fall. Wow! Very cool. Um, all right. Well, now let's let's kind of stay with your youth a little bit. Tell us a person who had some real influence on your life. Let's say pre-college. So any time in your youth up until college. I would have to say my dad was probably my biggest um, influence. He was always supportive of any silly thing I wanted to try or. Uh, really helped me find myself. Um, if I wanted to get a hamster, he bought me a hamster. Uh, he brought me home a cat. Uh, he let me go and play in the backyard and and do uh, bring home plants. Uh, he was not real enthusiastic when I brought home poison ivy, but other than that, he was okay. <laughs> Um, so he he really was probably my biggest fan and my biggest supporter, which really let me blossom and really try a lot of different things, which is kind of where uh, this my whole life has tended to at that point because it really gave me an interest in following up on everything that I found interesting. So. Uh, as I started at the agency in hazardous waste and, and was looking at uh, doing the inspections, when opportunities would come up to uh, start getting into permitting, I grabbed onto those and I was very lucky, again, with my supervisors and managers, but any opportunity that came the, my way, I grabbed onto and that was kind of the way my dad operated. They were uh, very, he was the same way, you know, he, he was a musician and then um, he went to work for the county in the tax circle, so he, he also also looked at new adventures in his life. Uh, even when he, he actually started in the county just before he turned 50. So that, that 50 seems to be a trend with my family. <laughs> Is your dad still alive? No, unfortunately he passed in 2004. Well, he sounds like a wonderful man. Um, did he get a chance to uh, meet um, some of your colleagues? Did you, or, you know, did, did you bring him to the office ever? And, and, and when you did afterwards, what was his take on it, or, or what? how did that go? Oh, yeah. Actually, we had a division outing, and uh, my parents came, and they uh, absolutely loved the regulating community. Um, all of the people in my office really were very warm and welcoming, and my parents just loved hanging out, and then... Um, we would also have parties at our house and, vo and invite a lot of my work friends and my dad got to know a lot of people and um, I don't know if you remember Steve Love and, and Rod. Mm -hmm. um, he would hang out with them and, and drink scotch. So, <laughs> one, of, um, one of Nancy's colleagues for a while there and, I, and um, she was telling about that, um, I got to spend some time with in a social sort of fun manner. Um, who um, collects classic cars and a project that Nancy will talk about here in a little bit that we worked on together in, in Akron. Um, he came down in, in one of his classic cars in the summer of the convertible. I'm not remembering exactly the year. It seems it was a mid-60s convertible. I think it was a Impala. Maybe you even know. Um, this is John Schmidt's car. Yeah. Um, and anyway, just really fun, sort of cruising around on a beautiful afternoon in, in Akron around this site area that we we had. Um, let's move that. Let's take that as a transition and moving ahead a little bit. And this will 
I'll ask this one personal kind of question, and then once you lead into talking about um, some of the projects that that you've worked on through your career, and I know we have some slides of them, and I know one of them includes a little bit of something that I've done. Mm -hmm. um, oh, the question is now. Let's take us later in life. Actually, two questions. One, first one. Now, if it's this coming Saturday, all right. So now it's Nancy today, and you don't have family obligations, all right. This is. You don't have to, you're going to do something totally on your own. It's a beautiful afternoon again, similar thing as when you were 15. What would we find Nancy doing? Um, actually probably very much similar to what I would do when I was 15 except now I have more money. Um, go to the zoo, go to the park, go kayaking. Um, we have a lot of that's one of the nice things about moving down to Florida is I've got a lot more opportunities down here uh, we're like seven miles from Marco so I could hop a eco excursion now that I work instead of being 15 um, or rent a kayak uh, we have a lot of areas around here that are we're right next to the Everglades so we're right at the bend of 75 that goes toward Alligator Alley so we could take an airboat ride, uh, we have the Naples Zoo, we have a botanical uh, garden which is just absolutely gorgeous down here in Naples. So that's pretty much what I do. <laughs> All right, and then that leads into a similar question that I asked about who impacted you um, when it was in your youth. Now, and let's talk about it specifically from a professional perspective and then make that a lead into talking about projects. So give us the answer to this question and then lead into talking about what I think our next few slides are going to show, which is who can you think of that's been an influence on you in your life professionally um, since, let's say, college, so post-college. Let's not include a college professor, although it could be a college professor who continued to have impact on you later. Um, so, you know, post high school and even post college, if there's a name that's, that's really impacted you. Um, actually, probably my husband. Um, I met him at my, my first job in environmental, um, and he has been very supportive in all the different things. He's been kind of my dad once my dad passed away, and, and even as we, once we got married, and uh, He's he's been my biggest cheerleader. He lets me do silly things. Um, at one point, when I was in uh, Ohio EPA, Amy Yursevich, who was our manager for Brownfields, um, was looking to start an environmental insurance program. And I'm like, oh, this sounds really interesting. I you know I've never done the business aspect, and that got me into looking at um, insurance and then uh, looking at uh, being a certified public administrator and then going on for my NBA um, but she you know my most people were going insurance that has nothing to do with science why would you even look at that and my husband's like sure why not go for it um, so he was really really supportive and I think that's kind of where I need uh, a very special person in my life that doesn't tell me that it, you know, that's not the best choice or, you know, why do that? Um, but that really supports me. So he's been he's been my best cheerleader and and the most important person in my life. What a cool! I think you're the first speaker we've had. Lots of our speakers have talked about either their husbands and or their fathers. Maybe the first that has has have, have had sort of both their father as their early figure and then their husband is there later. That's really awesome. So let's make that a transition and let's let's talk about some of the things you've been able to do through your career and it's been diverse and you've talked a little bit about some of them but maybe specifically on projects that that have been in the contaminated property area just because there's a commonality and the kinds of things that I've done um, and then and then transitioning I know you've written you've written a book you you've gotten your MBA in sustainability um, and, and so you have a very strong interest there. Uh, even talk about sort of what the challenge was of writing a book and, and how how scary that might have been at the front end. And was it? Did you have some trepidations about doing it? And as you were doing it, you know, did you did you want to quit at various times and so on? Uh, all that kind of stuff, just to prompt you a little bit. 
Okay. Um, well, I started in hazardous waste, and um, getting into that as your first step, I think, into the regulatory community was kind of interesting because it really allowed for a lot of diversity. Um, I got to work on uh, Toxic Sweep, which was a cleanup program that the city of Cleveland had started, and they were looking for various entities to join them, help them. So we had EPA, we had Ohio, we had, um, you know, the the hazmat people, the fire department, the building code, and it really gave you a real diversity in seeing what all the other jobs are that are out there that have to deal with some of these um, solid and hazardous waste issues. And then I transitioned into the division of emergency response and revitalization, uh, previously emergency response and, and remediation. Um, and there, that was kind of a, the super fun world, but you started, you first had to identify these sites. So we got into a lot of sampling, a lot of preliminary assessments, um, which later got you into the phase one, phase two assessments that you see now in brownfields. Uh, risk assessments, risk management was a whole nother aspect of the environmental field, which was very interesting in how the perception versus reality. Uh, impacted sites and then uh, moving through the circle and the Superfund actions and how they tied into RECRA um, and then being on the front end of the Brownfield program as it started to take shape and really getting into the Brownfield redevelopment um, and looking at and learning the grant programs and environmental insurance and um, then the federal facilities piece um, I got involved in and looked at the radiological uh, cleanups and how those interacted and then NRC with Ohio Department of Health and um, as I fell in love I actually fell in love more with brownfields than any of those opportunities and which kind of led into the sustainability because the brownfield allowed you a lot more flexibility with the voluntary action and, and looking at different things um, for cleanup standards. So you'd look at more sustainable options, the redevelopment um, of green infrastructure. And really the first one that I dealt with was the Flats East project, which was taking out all of the old entertainment that really went downhill in the mid um, mid 2000s and to revamp that into a more community oriented development. Um, unfortunately as we started to get into that uh, 2008 and uh, the economic uh, impacts with residential and the housing market and just the downturn in the economy really impacted that development. Um, so it was real interesting on how the developers and uh, Mr. Wolstein was really, really important in looking at the alternatives and where can we go if we can't build residential, where else can we go? And that flexibility was very interesting to watch from a business standpoint. Um, and then, of course, working with you both on the Goodyear project in Akron and the Ford plant in Lorain, Ohio. And I have to admit, Wayne, you are one of the most interesting people to work with because you are so flexible. You, you're always looking for those opportunities. You, you really have an interesting personality when you have such a diverse area and to really pull out the best of every project which was really neat to watch. So um, with the Ford Lorraine project really taking a very large development and making more of a business incubator for that area and bringing those jobs into a really uh, area that was devastated when that that particular facility went out and creating those opportunities for small business and then the Goodyear project was just I thought was just a perfect mesh between environmental and sustainability and looking at some of those at those aspects um, 
bringing in the grants, bringing in some green infrastructure to support the resiliency of the Akron area. By the way, Nancy, because these pictures here show it, um, I thank you, by the way, for the kind words. I really appreciate that. Um, the picture on the left here shows the Goodyear, excuse me, the Lorraine facility from a distance. And then the picture on the right is actually inside, but neither one of them give very much justice to the scope and size of this facility. Um, and again, I don't know, had there been any demo when you first started to get involved with Lorraine, or were you there before any of the demolition occurred? I was there when they were still pulling the cars off of the Ford Lorraine site. Wow. Okay, so wow, you, you proceeded, so she can even talk about it more. I, I actually was at the site, this is kind of a the day that Goodyear moved out, that, excuse me, that, yeah, that Goodyear moved out. Um, Ford, I'm sorry, I'm getting the two mixed up, that Ford moved out. And um, that was a, a sort of a landmark day because they didn't announce that closing, their entire closing, to, the, to really the remnant staff that was left. Everybody knew that eventually it was going to be closing, but there still was about 600 people working there. And the reason they didn't announce it is they, were, they had had some previous situations where when they announced it ahead of time there was actually some vandalism there were there were just really some kind of dumb acts that, that occurred that they were trying to avoid in this case so they literally announced the closing the day they were moving out and because of that um, people rushed out and I think there was some negative that occurred because of the, that also but bottom line is that a lot of what was still operating the day before on what was an assembly line at one point when, uh, my, don't quote my numbers anybody, but I think I'm pretty accurate at this, at its peak 2,100 Tauruses a day were coming off of the assembly line in that facility. 2,100 a day. And there were as many as 30,000 people on three shifts that worked there at one point. And this picture doesn't do it any justice. It's really hard to take a big pic a picture of a big building inside. but. Nancy will attest to this, the building didn't have any real demarcation walls inside. It was truly one huge big box, and a big box in this case is 4 million square feet, which if you equate that into acres is almost 100 acres. It's, it's like 85 acres or so inside in a building. So picture in your mind how big that is, and and this is no joke, weather, the building created weather it's inside itself once it was empty. I don't know if you ever heard that, Nancy, but oh, once yeah. it got emptied out, it would create its own weather inside the building. Mm -hmm. is, um, so if you haven't ever seen something like that, these buildings are amazing. Yeah, this is a great picture, All out with the old and in with the new. Nancy, talk about this a little bit, um, what, what we're seeing here. Yeah, I, I, we're, talking we're talking about the great, great um, side of the Ford Lorraine site, and Goodyear also had a large size, but it was split up, so there were a lot of different pieces oh. to the Goodyear site, um, which was kind of interesting. You had this, it was a, a real... Uh, challenge because you had building 116 and then you had um, the for the Goodyear headquarters and the power plant and Archwood 1 and 2 and things like that so you were looking at multiple buildings and and what you were going to do with each of those buildings so you had the headquarters building that they were actually revamping and, and redesigning uh, for use and then building a new headquarters and then uh, the picture that's being um, demolished is actually the building 116 uh, which was in use during World War II so uh, it was pretty much the same structure built in in World War II that they were clearing and um, going to repurpose the property but then you also had um, residential nearby and other facilities there was a large landfill the Goodyear test track was near these so that caused a lot of challenge along with the railroad that went in and out of these facilities and was still active in in pieces uh, through this area um, and then of course you had some new roadway that they wanted to design which was part of the uh, monthly meetings that we had and, and looking at cleaning up 
the stream and the Akron Air Dock when you talked about weather in a building. Now that's another building that has weather <laughs> in it. That's right. The largest, I think it's the largest sort of indoor space when you take, there's buildings inside that are much bigger, but the elevation and again the area inside for the for the, the square, which is not a square, but the, the, uh, the kind of oval object that it's in. And that's only from these, these two pictures here, what, Nancy, two miles away? Maybe not even two miles as the crow flies? Probably yeah. a mile and a half. Um, and this, the building on the right here is the new headquarters. And we say new, truly new. What, three years old maybe that building is? Maybe maybe yeah. four now, but um, but brand new. I that, that must have been an event because that's not always out there like that with all those boards. Now, I don't believe, Nancy, is it? I mean, that... The, the big ones are, but I'm not sure that all those smaller ones are out there all the time. Yeah, I don't believe so. This was actually their opening, so that's yeah. when this pi picture was taken. Yeah. It was right after they opened the building. Um, so that was the kinds of things. So Brian, go on. I know she's got another couple of really cool slides here talking about some of the things she's done with sustainability. So why don't you move ahead a slide or so here. Okay. Um, but... Really, a lot of these um, activities really spurred me and gave me a lot of information to move forward. And I, as I was going through my in, in uh, my MBA, that's when um, looking at a lot of the um, sustainability gave me the pieces of my book that I was that I put together as my thesis. Um, down here in Collier County, um, I'm. Basically, I administer their NELAC certified wastewater lab. I provide all the guidance um, and do a lot of those things. So I've really changed out of that whole design of, of the designing utopia. But um, the sustainability piece is what, where I was really focused as I was moving from the brownfields. Um, and I did get that down here. And that's part of the reason I took the job in Collier County. Um, the idea of reusing wastewater to irrigate various areas and um, looking at some of their recycling of uh, their quantities of water is just amazing. They're looking at storing their wastewater for using for irrigation so that they're not doing a lot of the just dump it back into a river or dump it back into uh, the ground. Um, so that, that kind of really plays into the sustainable options. Um, but my master's thesis basically focused more on community strategies and um, how to use what you have, identify your strengths and your assets of your community, and then use those to spur your redevelopment of the areas that are your brownfields, of the areas that you want to change, sort of like uh, when you walk into the beauty parlor and you say, I need a new look. Well, they're not going to basically change everything about you. They're going to pick the best aspects of your face and your hair and use that as the springboard to giving you your new look. So that's kind of where my book went. Um, and a lot of it, I, I have to admit, um, working with developers like yourself, Wayne, and others really gave me the opportunity to find the step-by-step -step way to make it easy when people are trying to do these type of brownfield projects. And that's why um, I wrote the book, was working with communities that weren't as fortunate to have developers like you or really good community development people in the county or the city they really kind of floundered. So I thought this book was kind of timely when I developed it to help people step by step understand the process, understand how to fit some of these sustainable concepts into their redevelopment and even into their development projects. You don't have to have a brownfield to use some of these sustainable concepts. So on the book again, um, you, and you've already said it, that it was, it was what you did to complete your master's, your MBA um, in sustainability. D did you have other options? What were, the, what were your options that they gave you for a final project? Could you, 
So could you do some other things? Um, and, and how did you choose the book to be what you did do? Uh, yeah, you could do a business plan, typical okay. business. Um, you could develop a, a green building and come up with a green building plan. Okay. You could get into um, policy design and, you know, how policy, environmental policy or building policies uh, fit with projects and what type of policy changes would be necessary. So there were a lot of different aspects to it. Um, there was even like marketing, green marketing projects and designs and things like that. So it was pretty much a very broad and opened thesis which was kind of nice. Um, but being in the brownfield realm at the time and, and seeing a need, that was kind of where I really um, focused my energies in designing this book. And it wasn't something that was actually initially designed as a book. It was kind of designed as a plan. And as I started writing it, it just kept getting bigger and bigger and more chapters. And, oh, this would, this would be helpful. And I developed templates and forms and, and resor resource lists and, and all of these different things um, as I see missing pieces as I was working in the Brownfields realm. And it came together as a book. So, and we see that it's available on Amazon. I'm assuming that's Kindle, correct? Can you buy it as a Kindle? It or is not? not Kindle. It's just um, basically hard. hard copy. And the reason I did that was because it is. Um, there are forms and there are different things in it. It just makes it easier for somebody to use it and print off areas and things like that. That that's probably a process that would scare people. T tell people how different it might have been doing this on Amazon versus if you had gone to a major publishing company. Sort of how did that work and, and having probably not having done it, did it surprise you in either how easy or how hard it was and so on? Yes, it did. Actually, it was a scary process. I think you you get used to the idea of the the movies where you have the author that talks to his publisher and says, here's my manuscript and walks out the door. And you kind of get that impression that, okay, you just you write it and then you give it to somebody else and you know you come back tomorrow and it's a book. And that definitely is not how the process <laughs> works. Um, I was very lucky. I had a, a good advisor for my master's program and he was very supportive and gave me some different publishers. Um, one of the things he did mention is um, you know, thinking about whether you want to give away your copyright because that becomes probably the biggest legal issue with any author. Um, and I selected a publisher where I keep my copyright, my copyrights. Um, but it took me about seven months to write the book, and it took me about seven months to get it published. Wow. So, um, and how much? What about the cost side? Um, is there a minimum number that you had to put into print, and how, how does that work? And in, in, in with working with Amazon, um, actually, there was a upfront fee for the publishing, and then it it outlined the process for you, um, and then you had an editing fee. And if there were certain things that were above and beyond just a standard book. Um, the pictures or different things may cost more if you want something in color versus not in color. So all those costs get added in as you, as you move forward. Um, and ebooks actually is an additional cost as well if you want to put it into an electronic format as opposed to the paper format. Um, and then they do the marketing and different things. But um, it, it gets very interesting because your first step, um, your picking out the type of book you want. So you actually pick out the size of your book. You pick out the type of font that you want in your book, the size of the font. Do you want paperback? Do you want hard copy? Do you want both? Um, and then choosing an editor to edit the text. And then you work with that editor, and they will go through it. And 
Um, for me, it was working with somebody that had science writing, but not necessarily brownfield experience. So uh, some of the things we'd have to change back and negotiate because it was terms that were for that very specific um, area of expertise in brownfields, and not just you know a large science background would have that expertise and know that what a gray field is versus a brown field and and uh, some of the sustainability terms in the green building console and you know is that a console or is that a committee and and going through a lot of that and it was kind of nice at the same time I joined ASTM so I was working on some of the greener cleanup initiatives and uh, working with the integrated sustainable um, committee for cleanups and it gave me a lot of perspective in listening to some of the feedback as we went through designing those guides as to where there were some concerns with um, the brownfields and some things to add to the book and some things where maybe a little bit more verbiage is needed for understanding. So one last book question and then I'll we got about seven or eight minutes left here and anybody who's got questions by the way I think you know this but you can put them in the chat section on the right hand side of your screen and um, and we'll try to address them and certainly when we when you watch this as a replay you can use the comments section that's below and you can put your questions there um, but I'm staying on the book for one last question um, it, it's available on Amazon how much does it cost and um, and again, and this is a funny one, but if somebody buys it on our audience and they want to send it back to you to have it sign, have you sign it for them? Can you do that? I can sign that if they want to send it to me. Um, I haven't had a book signing, <laughs> so uh, that would be new for me. Um, it's the new price for it is sixty four ninety nine. On Amazon, um, but as with Amazon, and if anybody's purchased books before, you can buy it used, you can buy it slightly used, um, and there's a ver variety of prices that you can get from Amazon, which is kind of nice. Um, but yeah, I, if somebody was interested in that, we definitely could do that. And if they're in Florida, we could um, get together at the park. <laughs> Need a bar, but since you said that, I'm going to segue to a really funny uh, local color story that only a very small part of our audience will even relate to anymore. But a long time ago, I'm not even going to say the year, but uh, a number of years ago, I took a college class down to Florida where we spent the entire month of January, and we started up in northern Florida, and we zigzagged, and we ended up at the end of the month in the Keys, and it was an amazing. Um, course it was called the ecology of Florida and I, it was myself and another professor I was the aquatic guy and he was the the land or terrestrial guy we had 20 students all of them were um, either upper division or graduate students and we camped most of the time so we were always trying to get to where we were in something civilized um, rather than just camping and we were near Fort Myers so a little bit north of you Mm -hmm. And that, and almost all of this group was over 21, and so a bunch of them said, you know, would you take us to a bar? Because we, we had two vans, and the only way they would get around is they had to go with the two profs that were the drivers. So we went to this bar in Fort Myers, and it was just a weekday afternoon, you know, dinner time. So the intent was we were going to eat dinner there, um, and we didn't even know. I mean, we're just out there at a campground somewhere, we drive in and we see this bar where it says they're going to have live music. So we thought, okay, that's better than just going somewhere with nothing. And we go into this bar and and very few of our listeners will have heard of this, but the group that was playing was Jerry Lewis and the Play. Excuse me, I screwed it up. Gary Lewis and the Playboys. Do you remember <laughs> that band? Does anybody? I'm looking around. No, Brian, no way, Brian would. Um, Deb would, but. Um, they they had they actually weren't one hit wonders. They did have a number of hits, number one kinds of hits on the charts. And their most famous song. Let's see if anybody will get it. Deb, do you know Nancy? Do you know what their most famous song was? No. Deb, do you remember? 
She's not listening here. She's working on something else. Um, this diamond ring doesn't. I think that that was actually the name, but this diamond ring doesn't shine for me anymore. Anyway, it's this diamond ring. But so there are about like 22 of us and nobody else in this bar. Nobody. I mean, in the three hours or so that we were there, there might have been two or three other people that came in. They played two sets for us. They took only like a five-minute break in between the sets. They played, covered anything that, it, that anybody wanted. This was a band that, it, you know, 20 years earlier was, or 10 years early maybe, not even 20, was at the top. They played stadiums, you know, all over. And yet here they were in this bar in Fort Myers basically giving a private performance. Here's the funny thing because I gave it away a little bit. Does the name Jerry Lewis mean anything to anybody? To you, Nancy? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. what what was Jerry Lewis? So not Gary Lewis, Jerry Lewis. Uh, well, yeah, there was the comedian. The comedian. <laughs> the comedian. He was an ama He was a really well known comedian. Well, he was Gary Lewis's father, and nobody in the room would believe him. He was talking from stage, and I I I think I knew it, so I believed it. He literally had to. He brought. He came out during the break between sets with. I don't know where he got him, but he had. First, he showed us his driver's license, and you know, and, and nobody even believed that was his, really his name. But he showed his driver's license; it really was. And then he somehow had some evidence that Jerry Lewis was his dad. I don't even remember what it was <laughs> anymore. But it was really fun, you know, sitting with this this guy in a in a bar in Fort Myers. It had to be on a main road, Nancy. If it's still there, you probably drive right by it. It was real close to the coast. Matter of fact, I think across the street from it was a marina. Yeah. So. Yeah, anyway, I, other than that, I don't remember more about it. But we're coming close to the end here. A couple more personal questions, really kind of fun ones. One of them is not so fun, but it, people, our audience loves this one. Um, can you think of an event in your life that wasn't very positive? Matter of fact, at the time when it happened, it seemed pretty negative, that when you look back on it today, it actually has, was something that was really good for you. And if it can be in a business context, it would even be better. Or, or it could be personal. And you don't have to give really details if they're really personal, but just generally. Or, uh, again, these kinds, of, these kinds of stories are things that people really love to hear. Well, actually, it happened just before I got the job down here in Florida. Um, I, was, um, I had applied for the assistant chief's job for our division in Columbus. And you know everybody's like, oh, you've you've got this sewn up. So I I had almost given up on coming down here, thinking, well, you know, if I'm moved to Columbus, that's at least south. I get, you know, a decent pay. I, I liked Ohio EPA and um, the people that I worked with. And at the time, you know, nobody knew what was going on. And I had taken the interview down here just to hedge my bets. And when I came back up, I found out that basically somebody was moved into that position um, and was taken for that position at the director's request. So we didn't even get a shot at interviewing, and that opportunity dissolved. And the opportunity um, worked out for me to come down here, and uh, I've got an excellent job. I have great people to work with. Um, my boss is a super lady, uh, very supportive, and just a lot of fun to work with. Um, to give you an idea, I got a chocolate cake for my birthday and a cookout <laughs> from my staff. So it, it's it's been an excellent move. Oh, great! And that's a good one because I know people have had things like that in their careers, and maybe the maybe the positive won't happen as quickly as it did for you, but it it. It probably will in the future sometime, so think about that. So last question, and I, I'm looking at our screen, and somebody had actually said actor when I asked the question, so the, the answer is close. Yeah, he, he was Jerry Lewis was an actor, did a lot of television and movie comedy. Um, anyway, here's the last question, which, again, this is one that I sent you, so you had a chance to think about it a little. Let's pretend that tomorrow morning you woke up and you realized that you were not on Earth anymore. Something had happened overnight. Wherever you were, though, it was comfortable and it looked an awful lot like Earth. You probably already had some conversations with whoever was around you, and and they said, "No, nah, this ain't Earth. It's some other place." But <clears throat> but you know, all your personal needs are taken care of. Um, you don't have to worry about your food or 
anything, and, and everything appears to be an awful lot like Earth, and all you found that you have is $500 and a laptop, what would you do over the next seven days? You're going to laugh at me, but that's kind of looking around and, and moving down to Florida. That was kind of what happened. Um, I moved to an area that I have never visited. I was never a tourist down here, and, and that seems to be uh, where most people got the idea to move down to, to southwest Florida, but I knew nothing about the area. And for my first seven days, basically, I took my laptop and my cell phone and took pictures of the area and told everybody how beautiful it was and would use the $500 to make sure I had Wi-Fi so I could get it all the way to Earth <laughs> and share my new life with everybody. Wow, so you're the first person we've had and have done this 50, 75 times to ask the question that has had a real life story that relates to it. That's very cool. Well, I am not seeing any other questions. We are right a little bit after time. This has been awesome. Really enjoyed it. I'll tell you what I really love about these is that most of the people that we interview, I have either met or known somehow, or I've got, and Nancy and I have been around each other again, we said for eight years. But I a lot of times learn more about somebody in these little hour sessions. You just We just don't talk on this level. So okay. I feel like I know you a lot better now, Lancey. I'm excited to come and visit you in Florida at some point, and I will definitely do that if you don't mind. No. Yeah. We'll I'd take love you out you. Uh, deep sea fishing. Yeah, that would be really fun. Um, and we also spent some time on Marco Island when we were down in that area, so it would be fun to see that again. Um, and anyway, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Um, we'll be editing this, as we said. Remember, everybody, We'll be on again in three weeks, not in two weeks, with Evan Folds, who is a innovative farmer in the North Carolina area, and he'll have a wonderful story for us to hear about. Um, he's a great speaker, just like Nancy has been for us here. And Nancy, thank you. Anything last thing you'd like to say? Nope. Just uh, hope everybody has sunny skies. Yeah, and and. I actually was on the phone a couple times in the day with Ohio today, and they've had a lot of rain there, as you probably have heard, and so I'm really hoping they have some sunny skies. And um, so we'll say goodbye from northern Colorado and from southwest Florida, and we'll see everybody in three weeks, and please listen to the replays. <laughs>